Hello, welcome to the Wireless Watch podcast. This is our weekly review of the most interesting stories that we have covered in our Wednesday publication. You can read more about the content that we're discussing today at rethinkresearch.biz or get in touch with us to discuss any of our research or consulting work. I am joined by my colleagues, Philip Hunter. Hello, once more. And Alex Davis. Thanks very much, Ellie. Hi guys, we're going to get started with Phil, who's going to tell us about his piece covering the potential outlook for the US after the elections. Yeah, thank you, Eddie. Yeah, and first I'll just say a very quick few words on three other pieces, which sort of um, take various of our stories, narratives forward. We sort of like to sort of, um, uh, we don't write too long, but we like to sort of build things up with references where relevant to previous pieces. And I, I and I did the next in our healthcare series, which was really looking about the role of mobile networks in sort of driving healthcare. You could say outwards towards a point of need. I mean, that, I mean that builds on some of the earlier themes that we've been talking about. And um, I suppose one point I made was that mobile operators have actually been sort of going on about healthcare for two decades. And um, you could say that um, when you read some of their earlier pronouncements, you wonder what they've been up to for all this time. But I think now um, we are seeing some definite projects and um, the question always is how things coalesce and come together. So I discussed a bit of that there. I then sort of um, have another episode in our private 5G narrative. And I, I look at how Ericsson has um, essentially tried to sort of um, make the most of a what seems like a bad hand by uh, by saying that nothing really much has happened in private 5g yet and it's been sort of um you know sort of not resting on its laurels but sort of more sort of preparing for when the real battle begins and um in in the 5g advanced era and so on and um so I talk about that and I talk about how they've repositioned the cradle point to the US based private networks company they acquired for 1.1 billion in 2020 for that. Then the other piece I look at is perhaps the next in our sort of, um, well, it's not really just about cybersecurity, but, but I, 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 I was talking about how telcos are sort of being subject to far more attack, done, done, not uh, cybersecurity attacks generally, but particularly distributed denial of service attacks over the last few years. And in, in a sense, it's sort of, you could say it's a coming of age saying that now that they really are custodians of critical infrastructure. And I, and I sort of go on to talk about how some telcos are actually exploiting that to become providers or, or become more major providers of cybersecurity. But and then my main piece of the week was really one where you could, you could almost say, um, that we've ended up with egg on our faces, but then along, <laughs> along, <laughs> alongside many others, because um, the actual curse of a weekly publication, which I suppose wireless watch is, it's weekly, but sort of new, um, is that um, almost um, like Sod's Law, big stories break just after they've gone to press. And I've often noticed that with magazines like The New Statesman and The Spectator or Time magazine, which um, uh, look strangely out of date the moment they appear in the newsstands, and such was the case last week but in, in our case we decided to um last week to take a look at um the implications of um um of trump's um, near miss and uh, and what appeared to be not quite his correlation but he, he was becoming a much stronger favorite to win the election in november if if biden sort of hung on for longer and so um our piece was well examined what that meant for technology and how quite a lot of big tech companies were sort of almost as, as they always do they want to be seen backing the winner and hoping to court favor and influence under that regime when it comes so um I, I, I did. I did talk about, um, you know, how um, Trump, uh, how how Biden's regime, in many senses, has actually really been a continuation of um, Trump's, for example, in its sort of um, quite strong stance against China. But then I was also um, examining areas where. Trump might um, might be more liberal, certainly over AI regulation, and um, which partly relates to the China um, situation. He doesn't want sort of to see China's 
major tech players enjoying an advantage through being less hampered by regulation and data controls and so on. And, 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 I, and I also noted that though that um, Trump had sort of done a bit of a U-turn over TikTok, which he had sort of wanted to really hobble because it was Chinese, but now is actually backing, partly because you know, TikTok is a competitor to Facebook or Meta, which, which he really um, has he dislikes gone, more he than he the Chinese. Even more than Chinese, exactly, exactly. But then, of course, just after we'd gone to press, um, President Biden suddenly resigns. And of course, so the, so the sort of um, the mood has changed yet again. And um, you know, we had to actually hurriedly rewrite our first paragraph you know, to sort of just acknowledge that. But uh, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, Trump is still favourite to win the election, but a much more narrow favourite now that he has a sort of candidate who, instead of being older and sort of almost, and almost clearly suffering from sort of... Um, Protein dementia is sort of now got a younger, more vibrant candidate who also carries some advantages and is able to really hit the Republican Party a, a bit in, in its weak spot over sort of um, the abortion mm. issue, for example. Mm. So anyway, there's, there's, discuss, um, there's discussion of, of, of some of that in the piece this week. Do you think that some of those big tech companies that had spoken out in support of Trump are likely to switch sides if they think again Harris well, well, some, some had sort of um, originally having been i mean the majority of tech companies had previously been democrat backers and some had been switching sides and i mentioned one or two of those in the piece and it'd be interesting to see how they stand because i mean trump has uh, sorry, not trump elon musk has sort of already seems to have backpedaled slightly on what he had announced last week as being strong yeah. <laughs> i don't know i feel like a lot of his tweets have been trying to diminish the sort of glitter and and youth that that Kamala Harris is being painted. I see. With. Well, I haven't. Yes, well, that may be the case. It, uh, se- it seemed like he was quite staunch in his support, continued support yeah, of Trump. Yeah, yeah. But mm. you never know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that, Phil. Now we have Alex talking, uh, giving us an update on his auto patent story he's been covering. Yeah. Cheers, Ellie. Uh, the gist of this is that the automakers a few weeks back. In Germany, a group of them got together, and the German regulator says, "Okay, you guys can negotiate as a group. Like we'll we'll tolerate this." And so that was the automotive licensing negotiation group. And at the time, we were like, "Well, this is interesting. Like this is talking about cellular patents and and video patents as well, which a lot of the cellular you know IP holders are involved in video too." So that was, you know, interesting, but not particularly sort of groundbreaking. And then last week, a sort of letter uh, emerges from six industry bodies that represent automakers, which in like wonderful fashion has a European association, but also has a German and a French one. Um, so these these six groups have written to Avanci, and Avanci is leading up the 5G automotive pool. It's got a 4G one too. It seems to be like the the stop you should head to if, if you want to license cellular patents for your car. Of course, please note, you'll have to strike individual licenses with a lot of other patent holders who are not in the pool. Um, but yeah, they they write, they send this public letter that says, Avanci isn't, isn't telling us uh, which patents are involved? It, it's not telling us how it's calculating this this price. This isn't fair. It it needs to you know do better. It needs to do do right by us. And yeah, the sort of the, the Chekhov's gun bit is that the the letter points to recent changes in and these are very nerdy changes. But the European Parliament back the European Commission's like new regulations regarding standards essential patents, so SEPs. And so like the letters pointing, you know, going, hey, you know, you should you should do something, otherwise we're gonna go, we're gonna go get a commission on you. And yeah, it's it's an odd kind of look because that sort of information is generally available. It's just probably not printed on the website. So there are like legitimate reasons why you wouldn't want to publish everything there. And then the Second part is a lot of the members of these organizations are signed up to these Avanci pools. So if these organizations really wanted to know 
what the terms were, they presumably could have spoken to the members. So that's not a particularly good look. And so if you are charitable, then these organizations are like acutely aware that they could find this information out. They just want to sort of lay the groundwork for like a big PR blitz and presumably some kind of legal challenge. And when when that letter first came out, there were lots of sort of questions that we were, we were scratching our heads and, and wondering. And then Vancey has published a a letter that responds to it. And in my initial draft, I'd sort of raised a bunch of these questions and I had to go back and revise it a bit, uh, much like Phil rewriting a piece. But it, the, the, the great line slash lines is a fancy notes with some surprise the open letter from certain automobile associations none of which have previously approached Avancy to ask any of the questions raised in fact most of the automaker members of these associations have already considered their licensing options and chosen to become Avancy vehicle licensees so yeah it's not a strong position that this group of of associations is arguing from and like the Avancy perspective is well, we're not licensing specific patents. We're licensing the intellectual property of these license uh, of of these licensors. And so, when you take a license, you are getting access to all of these patents uh, that that exist now and all the ones that could exist in the future. And so, like publishing a list is just kind of hard and not so productive because that's that's not actually what we're doing. You're you're licensing the ip in in total and and that was the kind of the main shift of it and there's a few pieces in the in the faq on the website which like answer these questions as well so yeah it's it's just it's a very odd position to be in and i suspect that lots of lawyers are going to get paid and nothing much will actually change is it a bit like the situation for video codecs, which has always been a bit convoluted? Yeah, the codec world was odd because it, all, it usually had two different two, pools challenged. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I I imagine there'll probably something, you know, probably be something along those lines here. But no, like Avancy first came on, on the scene with like an IoT pool. And I remember back then, because it was backed by Ericsson, I can't quite remember off the top of my head what Ericsson's involvement is now. Um, but at the time, we were like, oh, this isn't good. This is a power grab. Uh, but over the years, it's kind of changed. It, it it did dabble in, well, its owner, Marconi, dabbled in Video Codex 2, um, but then kind of dropped being a HEBC pool and focused on like licensing its own patents. And mm, yeah, that, yeah. it was a bit of a, it was a bit of an arc. Um, but yeah, like just odd, like a, a very weird set of events and yeah i i i wouldn't attribute to uh incompetence here what i would actually attribute to malice which which is why i think this is so mm. i've, I've Ooh, up there. strong words yeah. Yeah. i like yeah, it yeah, yeah. this we'll is the opposite of hanlon mm. Mm. nice cool. okay thank you i'm going to wrap up with a quick juicy nugget about eu legislation uh, but which actually i'm very excited about because it seems to be a very meaningful piece of legislation that will have some impact on those dreaded scope 3 emissions that are the majority of all of our carbon emissions and which are largely ignored because it's complex and convoluted so the recent the, the latest bit of paperwork from the EU is called the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, um, which is sounds long winded and boring. But this will be basically a strict set of rules that will apply to most European or at least EU firms of a certain size. And it will also refer to any companies operating in Europe uh, with a certain revenue basis or companies selling products to European companies. So it's going to be pretty broad reaching. And it means that the companies that fall within that banner will have to disclose certain uh, sustainability and human rights uh, violations or at least uh, activities to a high standard so that both of those uh, ESG elements are met with anybody working with a European company. And 
this is the most drastic action that I've come across in terms of getting co corporates of any it is corporates across all sectors but we're, we're obviously referring to how that will affect companies that we cover in within the telecom sector but this will refer to any company uh, under the under the bracket of this legislation and this will be huge it, it will take a long time to come through it will take two years before member states of the EU bring this into their law and even then there'll be a bit more time for corporates to start doing the research and auditing and processing all of the paperwork they're supposed mm -hmm. to do but I think this could set an example which is far more far-reaching than for example what we've seen in the US to get companies to hold their suppliers to account for the emissions that they create in the supply chain so I'm very excited about lots of lots of paperwork, basically. Oh, hopefully they're not yeah. printing off the paperwork, mm -hmm. though, right? Hopefully <laughs> not. I mean, that would be virtual paper. Yeah, that would be painful. Mm. Uh, no, they're not planning on doing that. And again, it's going to take a long time before we see this in action. Uh, I think people are planning to start preparing their books in this order for 2026, at least at the earliest. So it's not going to be immediate, but. Um, it should be meaningful because often we cover the sustainability actions of companies and there's always a big sort of gray cloud over how scope three is assessed and mm. how we can how, how we can hold vendors and suppliers to account for their emissions because there's there's just not much of a framework for doing that at the moment but this hopefully is 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 the framework fingers crossed yeah, great. So with that, we'll wrap up and remind our listeners to head to rethinkresearch.biz to read our content or get in touch. And with that, we will see you next week. Goodbye from me. And for me. Bye from me.